Thank you. So today we're continuing on for the actions of a new person. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it mean to live out the goodness and the glory of God every day? So if you're visiting today, as you can tell by the text, you've come at a difficult season. We're basically looking at what does it mean to be a believer, not what does it mean to be saved. We've looked at the last couple of weeks or months that everything we need to be saved is in Christ alone through faith alone. But this piece of scripture kind of highlights what does it mean to walk out our faith? What does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us? Um, you know, and, and the reason I love this piece of scripture is because it's exactly that. It shows us if we are believers, if we profess to follow God, to love God, to have Jesus radically change our lives and the indwelling of the Spirit to unite us, our lives need to look a certain way. Our actions need to follow a certain path. And, and then we say by Christ alone, through faith alone, but we need to live for kingdom purpose. And here's the thing, right? The reason I love this part of scripture in Ephesians 4 is we don't know what we don't know. Amen. We don't know what we don't know. So I bought this. No one can take it home. It's mine. Who, know, who knows what this is? No one no. This, who knows what it is? A saw. What type of saw? A circular saw. Who knows how to use a circular saw? Who knows how to use a circular saw correctly? <laughs> so, um, you see, we, very often we know what we know. We know some, about something. We know as believers we should be different. We know as believers we've got a new name, that we are Christ, Christ's children. But very often we don't know exactly how that works and how to operate correctly. And that's what exactly what Ephesians is looking at. Paul is encouraging us, hey, this is what it means to be a believer. Go back to the designer who designed us, who has created us, who has given us a new heart, a new passion, and start to live from that. Start to figure out how to walk correctly, to practice things of the Spirit correctly. That Christians are saved for community to reflect the glory of God living in a certain way. And we spoke about it last week quite a bit, and today's just kind of a continuation of that. We, we battle with our old self versus our new self, right? And we looked at it a lot last week. Our old self is still very much active. We, we said, Sproul said, R.C. Sproul said that the old self has been dealt a death blow, but he's not dead yet, right? And, and that resonates with us. We often do stuff we don't want to do. We often get angry or lash out or say things we shouldn't or laugh at things we shouldn't because we're in process. And Ephesians, Paul's not so much ridiculing or rebuking the Ephesians church. He's kind of saying, encouraging them, hey, continue to practice godliness. Continue to walk as in a manner worthy of the calling God has on you. Right? Because we'll never stumble into living for God in His glory. Right? We've never woken up all of a sudden on fire for the law. We practice those things. We practice walking in obedience. We practice the things of God that sets us on fire, that fans into flame, a passion, a desire for His name and, and living correctly. And, and the other thing, because so many of us think that we can be Christians by profession and not by action. That we profess to believe, but our actions never differ. Our language never differs, right? Or our, our, our etiquette never differs. Our morals never di differ. Our ethical um, performance at work never differs. And, and, and Ephesians is a reminder, as believers, our lives look different. As believers, your life reflects the glory of God as we looked at last week. And Paul, as I said, he's not rebuking them. He's encouraging them, hey, God has given you a gift to be a reflector of His glory. God has endowed you with gift and gifts and grace and the fruit of the Spirit to reflect that to those around you for the betterment of community. We read in Ezekiel 36, 26, and then later on um, in Acts 1, it says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your old stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And that's like so many of us, we were hardened, our hearts were hardened for the things of God, for other people. Now we're saved, and we kind of all of a sudden care about other people, but we don't know how to care for them. We don't know how to love them. We don't know how to practice the things God has given us. And Ephesians shows us that, that so much of living out of our faith, living our faith out because of who God is and what He's done, not to be saved. Nothing I'm saying this morning makes you saved. Everything this morning is because you are saved by the grace of God. It says it will affect how we speak, what we fill our lives with, and ultimately how we treat one another. That's the unity and the work of the Spirit that we looked at in Ephesians 2 and 3. 
And now Paul's kind of just extenuating and said, the Spirit is at work within you. Now practice the work of the Spirit on a daily basis. Practice Spirit life, for lack of a term. And, and, and not in a legalistic way, watching what we, we say and how we treat people, but in understanding an overflow of our hearts, our mouths will speak. Right? You know, we speak about it all the time. Not, I'm not trying to tell you what to watch and what not to watch, but I can tell you the trajectory of believers' lives by who they hang out with and what they allow themselves to watch on, on TV and series and different things. Not always, but we know that. We know it in our own life. When have we, we started to struggle with our walk with God? When have we become more filled with um, uh, or, or swear words or our minds with swear words or um, lust or... Um, disunity, whatever it is, it's from what we watch and what we put in. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for that, but I'm trying to or make it legalistic, make sure you're only watching PG shows, but realizing everything we put in comes out in action, in thought, in, in thinking, right? Jesus says it this way. He says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And what, we, what you say flows from what is in your heart. It's Luke 6.45. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So when we're getting, we're going to get to anger and, and malice and hatred and unforgiveness. All of those things stem from somewhere. That's what Jesus is saying. And it stems from what we're filling our daily lives with, what we're surrounding ourselves with, what we meditate on, what we allow to go unchecked in our lives. And we learn how to walk and talk like a believer when we learn to watch what we consume as a believer. And I'm not trying to make this legalistic. I'm trying to make it gracious. And that's what Paul is saying. We need to be very careful what we fill our days with. What we feed the Spirit will determine if we grieve Him or empower Him. Right? That's what we've been looking at. Our old self versus our new self. We looked at it last week, that verse that says we are the, of the Spirit or of the, the flesh. And whoever we're feeding is going to triumph. Whoever we're feeding is going to produce anger or love or patience or kindness. And Paul starts today with believers being truthful, not lying. None of us lie, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and I would say when it comes to navigating people's lives with them and sin and process, I'm generally a, a, grace, a, a graceful guy or gracious in those things. But there's one thing that drives me crazy um, and, and it's lying. I, I cannot stand lying and it might stem from some childhood trauma, I don't know, but lying like is the, it's disloyal, it's um, rooted in pride, it's rooted in self. Even most of mine and Vicky's marriage fights in the early days was because plans would change and I would perceive that as she's lying to me and we, I'd call her a liar. Um, it's not a great way to build a marriage, <laughs> but, but I had to learn life, things happen, but that's just my, the God has designed me to love truth. My holy discontent, that which keeps me up at night, is truth. Because truth will set us free. Truth reveals who God is and connects us with Him. We can grow in knowledge. We can grow in relationship with God through truth. And verse 25 tells us, so stop telling lies. And here's the thing. Who do lies hurt? Paul tells us. He says this. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Lying and truthfulness is never about ourselves, it's about community. God has given us the gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit to feed and benefit the community we find ourselves in. We've been looking at it, right? When I produce fruit, when I'm joyful, when I'm um, patient and kind and all of these things, who benefits? The people in my life. When I lie and I'm destructive and I'm deceitful, who doesn't benefit? The people in my life. Time and time again, we think we sin in a vacuum. We think we do things only in private, but actually it overflows to how we engage and act with one another. That's what Paul's saying about lying, about sin, is it always affects community. You can go trace throughout Scripture, go and read where the Spirit is poured out, where the presence of God is there, it's building community. When the devil is at work, it's building destruction and decay and injustice. The same is true in our lives. When we allow ourselves to become angry or joke about the wrong things or whatever it is, we produce glimpses of hell rather than glimpses of heaven. We need to be, take note this morning and just take a step back and say, okay, Lord, we need to be flavored by you. We need to walk in what it is you have for us. God empowers us with gifts to build and restore relationship. The sinful self will always break down and destroy. And lying is a failure to love like Christ has called us to. 
It's that simple because it's about loyalty. It's really important. Loyalty still matters. It still counts. That's what Paul's saying. We're part of one body. And lying is not loyal. So if you, you stick your hand on the stove and, and your brain doesn't tell you, or your hand doesn't tell your brain, hey, the stove is hot, what happens? You burn. It's painful. It's destructive. The same way within a body of believers where there's lying or deceitfulness or any, in any relationship, it leads to breakdown. It leads to pain and hurt instead of blessing and, and abundance. And there's no such thing as a white lie. So I will pray for you as you navigate with wisdom how certain pants make individuals look. Um, but, <laughs> but we are to be a people of truth. As a believer, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to speak truth. Sorry, Sunday school did leave. My bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but we are to be a people of truth. And when we compromise on any truth, we're going against the spirit of truth within us. It's that simple. When we lie, we go against the spirit of truth that was in it, within us. We grieve the spirit. We break the Father's heart when we lie. And, and that's what I'm trying to get us to this understanding about ethics and behavior and all of these things. It's against first God and then against the people he places around us. Lying is never a sin against self. It's a sin against those that God has entrusted us to love. And, and, and he goes from lying to our next favorite, anger. <laughs> Anyone been angry lately with ESCOM, <laughs> with, the, you know, with the mic operators? I don't know. But, but right, we get angry, and, and we're going to look at it in a moment. Paul says Christian anger is not sinful, but it can be sinful. Right, and I love there's this idea of a rule. I think it's the rule of five, whatever it is. If it won't matter in five minutes or five years, then don't give it five minutes. So if it won't matter in five years or 20 years, don't give it more than five minutes to be upset about. Because very often something we, someone spills milk or whatever it is, and that becomes what we fixate on for the whole day and become so angry. And in five minutes time, we don't even know why we're angry, but we're angry for the rest of the day. And, and, and the Lord has called us to be encouragers, not destroyers. And that's the tension. And here's the thing. Damage always lasts longer than encouragement. You can remember horrible words spoken against you way more than you can remember any encouraging words. Am I right? And that's why when we do pre-marriage counseling or people come to us and, and they've had three or five or ten years of decay and destruction, and then in one session they want everything to be right because they've changed their mind. And I have to keep telling them it takes way longer to restore and rebuild than it does to destroy. Always, or generally always, unless there's some supernatural, miraculous restoration. So we're called to be encouragers, to not get angry, um, to have the, the, the best relationship stems from self-control. Verse 26 says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin. The sin is when we are controlled by emotion, controlled by rage. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for, God, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Again, gives a foothold to destruction, to decay, to bitterness. Paul is not saying, yeah, Christians never get angry. There's such a thing as righteous anger. He's saying, don't be controlled by it. Don't let it boil over. Anger is not sinful, but it can lead to sin. The righteous anger, we see Jesus, I think it's, Mark 6, where he flips over tables because it's an injustice. The house, the, the, the house of God is a place for all people for prayer, um, and, and they're excluding people. There's injustice, so he gets angry. That leads him to action, which ultimately leads to restoration. We see throughout the Old Testament, God gets really angry at sin and leads him to action and discipline and punishment. So anger can lead us to restorative work. That's a righteous anger. Someone else, another pastor says, calls it a holy discontent. What is your holy discontent? Something that keeps you up at night, something that drives you, something that when you think about it, your heart almost breaks, but your spirit starts to move. Your heart breaks, but your spirit moves. You're like, this is not right. And it doesn't matter how hopeless the situation is. It doesn't matter how broken the situation is. You're going to do something. And they may just be, you're, you're praying every day for that same situation. You're, you're pushing into that. You're giving finances, whatever it is. That is your holy discontent. You cannot let the world be as the world is while you are still alive. That's your holy discontent. That's a gift from God, and it is different for all people. 
And, and it's very important that we don't make our holy discontent someone else's holy discontent because God has given them that, but we can encourage them in that. Um, but, but that's a righteous anger. That's an anger where God looks and he says, my heart breaks and I'm with you and we will change the world. Because the Spirit is at work and it will take a few, they take seriously the call on their lives and we will see this nation transformed. I believe it. That's the holy discontent. That's the gift that God has given us. Righteous anger leads to restorative work, but sinful anger leads to destruction. Time and time again. We've all had moments in anger that has led to breakdown of relationship. What we do there is we repent first to God and then to the other person. We take responsibility and we walk in that. And God, uh, uh, God is so good to us, right? He doesn't just say, don't be angry. He gives us gifts so we're not controlled by anger. He gives us alternatives to walk in and live in. He says the first thing he gives us as believers is the indwelling of the Spirit is self-control. Right? Some of us don't feel like we have self-control on some days or we're just so overwhelmed and angry and stressed or whatever it is that it just flows out. But again, we need to then watch what we're filling our lives with that our response is always angry and destructive and bitter. But self-control empowered by the Holy Spirit. But again, the Spirit needs to be fed. Self-control is pointless if it is not fed by Scripture, fed by the Spirit. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. And there again is that kind of passion, that chias for like, yeah, that chias of, Lord, we can do this. We can do something for kingdom glory. But a power, love, and self-discipline. The Bible speaks about self-control a lot. And it's something we practice and grow in. We have the gift of self-control, but it is not a gift we know how to use. Amen. Just me. <laughs> we have the circular saw. We need to plug it into power, but we have no idea how powerful and strong it truly is until we learn to use it. All the disciplines God has gifted us with, all the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, are more like muscles and solid walls. And here's the thing, we, we believe God has gifted us with grace, mercy, patience, kindness, that we just have it, but God says, no, I've given it to you to practice. It's like a muscle that we need to use it, we need to exercise it, we need to put it into practice in the correct way that we would grow stronger and more powerful and more stable in the gifts that God has given us. And what happens when you don't use muscles? They shrink. <laughs> you know, they shrink and your belly gets bigger. Your belly steals all your muscles. It's not scientific, but it's just what I've observed in my own life. <laughs> but, but your muscles atrophy, right? They get weak. They get useless. Are your muscles still there? Yes. They're just weak. And many of us resonate with that. Many of us have had times in our lives where we have been spiritually on fire, where we've connected with God, we've walked with God, we've exercised the gifts of the Spirit that He has given us, and then other times we just suck for lack of a term. We're disconnected to God, we're angry, we're frustrated. There doesn't seem to be any of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and the gift of the Spirit in our lives, but it is because we have failed to exercise the gifts rather than they have been removed. Our muscles have atrophied, our faith has atrophied. In the same way food and, and what we consume builds our body, the same way the Spirit needs the Word of God, the community of believers, to sustain us and grow us, to get us motivated and on fire for the things of God. And along with self-control, Paul puts a time frame on our anger. Have you ever, ever seen this in the text? It always says, don't go to bed angry. Right? It's great advice for couples. But he says, kind of says, we can get angry, but when we linger on it, when we fixate on it, when we meditate on it, it very quickly turns into sin very quickly drives us and ruins us. How many times have we got angry and we just simmer on it? That, that's what we fixate on the whole day, right? And, and we love anger because we love control. We think if we're angry at people or situations, we have power. We're in control, right? That's, again, the selfishness of our nature. And we simmer, we go to bed angry, we wake up, we don't even remember why we're angry, but it affects our mood. It affects how we treat people. You don't have to put your hand up. How many of us are angry at people, but you can't remember why? You just know you don't like them. <laughs> like, right? And every time you think of them, you become angry. You become embittered. You become, you're robbing yourself of the presence and the peace of God. Because we won't let go. 
It affects how we treat people, how we engage with people, how we interact with people. And anger affects the body. If you're angry and stressed, it's going to affect your body physically, but it also affects your body spiritually. It affects your connection with the Lord, a connection with those around us. We need to deal with it. Paul is saying, deal with your anger immediately. Do not give the devil a foothold in your life. There are a few things in, in, in Scripture that says it will give the devil not access into us, but access into our lives and decay and destruction by anger and bitterness and frustration. Here's the thing. We either deal with anger or it deals with you. We either learn to deal with our anger, to take it to the Lord. I love that. It says take it to the Lord. He can handle your anger. He can handle your outbursts. It doesn't say read the Psalms. The Psalms are full of just these outbursts of frustration and bitterness and, and anger, but it always pivots back to God is good and sovereign and in control. So I'm not telling you to bury your anger. Your brain will explode. Your body will release it somehow and it will not be pretty. Take it to the Lord. Put a time frame on your sulking. Right? Some of us like to sulk too long. We sit and we sulk and we sulk and we sulk and we forget why we're sulking, but it just feels good to sulk because we have self-pity parties and we have friends that care too much, so they join in the sulking party. And God's called us to get together to worship and praise, not to sulk and, 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 and it occupies space that is reserved for worship because you cannot meditate on bitterness, anger, and frustration and who God is. Those two are competing against each other. Anger will always rob us of worship. Bitterness will always rob us of worship. The author of Hebrews writes about bitterness is, it, it, as an attitude of our heart. Hebrews 12, 15. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. So it is our job to look after one another, that we walk together, encourage one another, love one another. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Again, bitterness is never only affects us it affects community and we've met people who carry and manifest the spirit of bitterness and anger and negativity and God has called us to carry Jesus which is love which is encouragement with this patience doesn't mean we don't have those individuals where we can share our hurts and frustrations and bitterness with but we frame it we time it we say this is not who I am this is not what I fixate on I fixate on the God that is with me in decay and brokenness and hurt and that is where my heart comes from that is where my strength comes from and my hope not from being able to control anger and bitterness and unforgiveness over people right the enemy knows if he can keep us angry he can keep our witness tainted angry anger is bigger than just our emotions it works against the witness as children of the loving and peaceful God that's why it's so serious. Paul wants the Ephesus church to shine the glory of God, the goodness of God. I want us as a church to shine God's glory. If there's anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, malice, um, crass joking, whatever it is, it will rob us of the presence of God, the manifest spirit of God, and we will be a poor witness. Because Paul goes on, and I like, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Right? Nowhere in Scripture does it allow us to steal. Amen. We don't need to preach about that. It's quite, but it says, instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Believer, being a believer is never about self. It's never about accumulating so we can have. It's about being a blessing so we can be a, a blessing. Being blessed so we can be a blessing. Right from Genesis 12, the first missional mandate, I will bless you so you can bless others. Throughout Scripture, from the beginning till the end, we are called to be through channels of the grace, the mercy, and the goodness of God. It's not about us. We work hard, we live generously, we give generously. You, next he goes, the use of t the tongue. The, the Bible speaks about how damaging the tongue can be. We've experienced it in our own lives, we know it to be true. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, not, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Again, unwholesome talk does not benefit the people in our lives. Everything Paul's speaking about has an impact on community. And, and, and we know just because something is funny doesn't make it right. And, and we allow so many things, an injustice um, against women, against children, against races, whatever it is, so that we can laugh and look cool or whatever it is. And it grieves the spirit. It saddens the spirit when believers act like the world in what we joke about, in what we consume. 
It says a, a speech is to be flavored with life and not death. And it goes on, if we, grie- we can grieve the Holy Spirit, it goes, verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, don't sadden Him, don't, bra- yeah, don't sadden Him with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Saying, look, the Holy Spirit is a gift that God has given us that has sealed us. How are you always saved? Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not because you've kept any of the rules above. You weren't angry. You paid your tithe. You came to church. You are saved today because this Holy Spirit has sealed you. Amen. We are thankful for that role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We will not lose our salvation because Christ has secured us and sealed us by the Spirit. And yet we have the audacity for that security then to grieve Him and walk against Him. And and, and that's what Paul's saying. He says, just live in a way that brings the glory and the joy of the Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit's work is to sanctify us, to refine us, to make us reflect more of who Jesus is. But we resort to stealing and swearing and bitterness. We're only resisting the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And all of those things flow from anger. If I said, when was the last time you raged or, or were full of bitterness or slander or got in a fight? It's generally rooted by anger. You got such a point, you just saw red, you lost your mind. And you just spoke when you shouldn't have. You just carried on, carried on. Paul's saying, don't do that. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. And one of the most difficult parts of the Lord's prayer is, Lord, forgive our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, I forgive our debts as we forgive our debts. The debtors, Matthew 6 verse 12. As Christians, we are forgiving people. There's no doubt. And we are likewise called to be a forgiving people. Not in our own strength, but through the forgiveness that we have received, that it would flow through us. Jesus shows us in his teachings, in his actions, time and time again, how do we treat people that would be ugly to us, that would slander us, that would normally drive us to anger? We're called to forgive and love. I'm not speaking about abusive relationships here, but in ge- our, our general interactions. And this morning, I want to ask the question as we, we near the end Are you forgiven? Do you know that Jesus do you know Jesus as your personal friend and savior? Do you walk with him? Do you commune with him? Do you have a relationship with him that the spirit has sealed you for eternity? Cuz I think a lot of times we we think we have that but we've never called out to him. We've never surrendered his life our lives to him afresh in you. Or maybe this morning you're kind of in that in between where you have surrendered your life but your muscles have gone weak. Your faith has gone weak and, and, and it looks like it's an impossible way to turn and refix your eyes on, on God. But God is calling us this morning because He wants to set us free. And from that place of abundant grace, that place of love and mercy and acceptedness, we start to live out the way Paul has called us to live. And the second question from that identity as a child of God, who do you need to forgive? There's always people in our lives we need to forgive. And the reason Jesus speaks about it so much, the reason the Spirit prompts us so much on it is because He wants us to be free. He wants us to know how much it cost Christ on that cross for us to be forgiven and to allow it to flow through us. Who are you angry towards? Who do you need to let go, past and present? And as I was going over my notes this morning, I, I felt the Lord just prompting and said, maybe you're angry at yourself. Right, I've sat with enough people going through hardship and, and difficulty and health dilemmas to know very often we become guilt-ridden and angry because we've become sick. We've, we get angry because I haven't responded like I wish I would have in that moment. We become angry because we've made choices in our lives that have landed us where we are and we cannot forgive ourselves. We're quite happy for an eternity forgiveness, but we don't extend that forgiveness to ourselves. And this morning, God is saying, I am sufficient. Every mistake that you have made, every time that you have failed, I am sufficient. And and, and then we would look and say, Lord, I want to forgive. But I also want to forgive myself that I haven't always got it right. 
I won't always get it right until I'm in the presence of Jesus and he stands before me as my righteousness, as my goodness, as my, my perfection. But God wants you to be free. And he does not call us to muster up some sort of forgiveness or I'm going to be a better person now because the pastor spoke about forgiveness. He says you will forgive because you have been forgiven. That streams of living water would flow through you for the betterment of those in your life. God is not calling you to forgive some from self-help nonsense that we've mustered up. He's calling you to allow the Spirit to flow through you. And that's why if we do not know the Spirit of forgiveness, if we do not walk with God as His children, we will not truly forgive. Because we will always hold on. And He calls us to forgive because we have been forgiven. To let for forgiveness flow through us towards those in our lives. And as I, I'm going to close in prayer, the band's going to come up. Yes, please. No. Is this working? Okay. <laughs> I didn't tell Peter to me well. My name is Erica. I've only been here a few months. No, nearly a year. I was orphaned when I was six, both my parents, but I ran away before I was orphaned. I went into the home of a very rich man and his wife, who my parents died about. And within a year, both my parents were dead. My foster father was a lawyer and a member of parliament. He started raping me from the age of eight years old. I'm now 19, 89, sorry. <laughs> I'm now 89, and it has taken me 80 years to forgive what has happened to me. And now I am free. Yeah, that's, thank you for that wonderful testimony. And I think that's exactly it. It doesn't minimize our pain. It maximizes grace. And, and, and yeah, so let me close in prayer as the, the team comes up. Yes, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven, Lord. And Lord, we know that to, to whom much is given, much is required, Lord. And we know there's no extent of the amount of forgiveness that we have endured, Lord. We know the song that sings, we'll never know what it costs to see our sins upon that cross. We'll never know the fullness of what it means for us to be forgiven, Lord, but we know that we are called to be a people of forgiveness, Lord. And we thank you that you are patient with us, Lord, whether it takes us 80 years or 8 minutes, Lord, you are journeying with us, and we thank you for that, Lord. We pray against any condemnation or attacks of the enemy now, Lord, that would bring shame in our lives. We, were, we are struggling with forgiveness. We're struggling in situations, Lord, because we know God is there and He is at work. But Lord, this morning, we just want to look inwardly this morning, Lord, and say, Lord, you know, if, if, if that's you, that you don't know the Lord, that you would cry out to the Lord this morning. You would surrender afresh in you and say, Lord, I'm all in. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know. I, I, I just see that this is what it means to walk in what it is you have for us. And then we'll commit to walk in it, to disciple in it, to grow in it, to learn in it. And maybe this morning that you're kind of stuck in that space where you were once on fire and committed and growing. And you've kind of just gone allowed life to wear you down, which it does. And God has never left you nor forsaken you. He's with you in the midst of it. That you would just say, Lord, uh, grow me, develop me this morning, Lord. And if there's 
unforgiveness against people or individuals this morning, you would once again lay it down and say, Lord, I keep taking this back. But this morning I want to forgive not from myself, but from you through me. That you would renew my mind, you would renew my heart towards these people. You would set us free. And maybe you, you're angry at yourself this morning. And the Father is just inviting you in. And just get the picture where He's inviting you in and says, it's okay. It's not justifying where there's sin or there's need for restoration. But He's saying, it's okay, you're not God. I am. And I'm sufficient. And I'm good. And I'm with you. So as we navigate this now, as we sing, Lord, as we speak the name of Jesus, Lord, we know there's power in your name, but we know there's power in acti acting and walking in your name, Lord. So we just pray you guide and direct us this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.